I don't know how much of it you heard. I've been sitting here wondering if my jokes will get any better before I tell them again. But um, again, thank you all for joining us. And I'm here to talk about this subject uh, that is somewhat unfamiliar in Canadian political uh, culture. You see the word up there. Yeah, it is, of course, courage. And I chickened out of flying to Alberta uh, because, as Benjamin Franklin said, he that's a ground knows where the shoal doth lie. And I want to start the conference by talking about some shoals that we need to avoid in order to get Alberta where we would like to have it. You know, there are no real safe harbors in human affairs, especially not politics, but uh, insofar as we can get it to a good place, uh, we're going to take courage. And as I pointed out, Aristotle called courage the first among virtues because it's what makes the muskrat guard his musk. No, that was uh, the cowardly lion. Aristotle said courage is first among virtues because without it, we only practice the others when it's safe to do so. And I, as you know, in politics, it's pretty rarely safe to uh, tell the truth and be honest and come clean about things and share with voters the existence of real difficulties. Uh, which is why, as I've said before in these gatherings, I think it's risky to uh, put too much faith in politicians or rather the wrong kind of faith. You can be fairly confident that politicians will get in front of parades that are already large and loud, but they're not gonna create them with rare exceptions. And even if you do get a good parade going, uh, very often the political leader, as they are dubbed, will try and divert it to a safe if pointless route. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the fair deal panel. Uh, I'm here to talk about courage and to remind you also that what Aristotle said about virtue, I think is a, a, a neglected insight worth uh, paying careful attention to. That to Aristotle, you didn't, he didn't see virtue as the polar opposite of vice, and you're either brave or you're cowardly. He saw virtues as a golden mean between two opposite failings. And before I get further into that, I want to emphasize that Aristotle was not, and I am not, recommending a mushy compromise, where you just insist on splitting the difference and developing something incoherent that can't possibly work or else slicing the salami and giving it away bit by bit because you gave, if you gave the whole thing away at once, it would alarm your supporters. What Aristotle meant is that courage, the real glorious kind, the kind that makes a king out of a slave and makes the flag on the mast to wave, occupies a sunlit high ground between the abyss of cowardice on one side and rashness on the other. That virtues tend to be uh, strong, place between two weak places. And so at this conference, you know, and to fix Alberta's problems, to be a good citizen and to get through life with something resembling distinction, you need to be courageous rather than either cowardly or rash. And as I say, not I think unreasonably unkindly, virtually every politician you ever heard of, except, you know, Maxime Bernier, Winston Churchill or Ronald Reagan, tend to fall into the abyss of cowardice. But politics is also contaminated by people who are on the rash side. And in this group, I count conspiracy theorists who charge ahead recklessly without making sure that what they're saying makes any sense. And so we don't want to be uh, weak and we don't want to be brutal. We want to be strong. We don't want to be slow and we don't want to be hasty. We want to be purposeful. We don't want to be muddled and we don't want to be pedantic. Well, I do, but you don't. Uh, we want to be smart. And there was a line I came across in one of the Rex Stout novels featuring Nero Wolfe. And if you're not familiar with Nero Wolfe, he's one of the two greatest detectives in fiction along with Sherlock Holmes, this eccentric orchid fancy and gourmet detective. And someone asks him a hasty question, what he believes about the case. And he says that he doesn't yet have enough basis to believe anything. He says, I don't try to abolish reality by shutting my eyes, nor do I gobble garbage. And I thought that was a very nice and rather pointed way of summing up the necessity to be careful about the way we think about things, to be neither uh, too unwilling to face things or too credulous in the face of them. And since I'm praising virtues, I should also say, I'm not suggesting that I'm the example here. You know, what a great place the world would be if other people were more like me. Nor am I here to tell you that virtue is better than vice. Uh, you may know the story about President Calvin Coolidge going to church one Sunday when his wife was too ill to go. And when he came back, 
she asked him what the minister had talked about, and Coolidge, who was a man of few words, replied, sin. And Grace Coolidge waited a while for him to elaborate, but he didn't. So she said, well, what did he say about it? And Coolidge replied, he was against it. And although that was true and a valuable point, it, it doesn't get us very far. Um, I'm against sin, but so are a lot of people uh, who had more virtues than I do, and it's been said before. The reason I want to talk about courage is I think that there's a really serious deficit of it in the modern world, that it's particularly a problem in public affairs, and that we are going to need it to fix our governance problems. Alberta's position within the Canadian Federation and Alberta's treatment are, we are convinced, profoundly wrong. And in order to fix it, we're going to need a lot of courage. And so I want to talk a little bit about where, where I see failings of courage in public policy. I mean, you, you may have heard that there's a pandemic out there. And it would be completely rash to ignore COVID-19. Some people have done that. That was their solution. Uh, I can't think about this carefully, so I'm just going to pretend it's not there. And this has had some pretty serious consequences. But you remember the, the initial response of politicians and policymakers in the public sector across the spectrum and around the world was actually to ignore it because they didn't want to annoy people by saying, oh no, there's a disease. Doug Ford told young people, go enjoy March break. He didn't want to tell them not to travel. Nancy Pelosi and Bill de Blasio said, go out to a crowded Chinese restaurant, show you're not a bigot. They all did what you'd expect them to do because they didn't want to upset their constituencies. And then they realized it was a problem and they all panicked and wanted to lock everybody in their basement for eight years so nobody would die of the disease and they'd get blamed. And I think when you see the reluctance to engage in sensible reopening, the incredible delay, the unwillingness to admit that life has its ups and downs, and one of the downs is that there are diseases, I think the problem is cowardice. They're, they don't want to tell people we can't prevent you all from getting this disease. And this is part of a, uh, a more generic problem, I think, in, in culture. A failure to grasp this point, and this is my point was made by Eep in the film, The Crudes. So you're going to get a lot of culture in this uh, talk, or at least things I mistake for culture. So here's what Eep said about their, uh, their lifestyle back in Paleolithic times. That wasn't living. That was just not dying. There is a difference. And when it comes to the COVID lockdown, a lot of politicians seem to think as long as you're not dead, nothing bad has happened to you. So you can, be, you can be shut in your house, have no social contact, lose your job, see your government become insolvent. It's fine. You didn't die of COVID. You have escaped all the potential negative consequences. But this to me is a kind of cowardly failure to face what reality is like. If you don't like eat crude, here's Chris Sully from the National Post. Um, and I wouldn't want to see Chris in that outfit, but there we are. He said, what Sweden did was take a broader view of public health than not dying of COVID-19. Whoops, sorry. Um, it's public health officials who famously crafted the country's policies independent of politicians took the outrageous in Ontario view that being able to go about one's life in something approaching a normal fashion has value beyond how much money you spend while you're out of the house. But in order to defend that view, you have to say, we do understand that some people will get this disease and some will suffer serious consequences, possibly including death. And we cannot prevent everybody from dying of everything. We cannot get rid of all the negative consequences of there being a pandemic. And they're just afraid to say that. So they tell you, well, the safety of our children is our top priority. So maybe we won't reopen the schools as though there was no cost to the children's education, to their health, from not socializing and from not getting a proper schooling. Um, and we're seeing this in other areas too. There are far too few politicians who seem willing to stand up and say, look, there's a middle ground between racist policing and no policing. You wouldn't think it would take a lot of nerve to say that, but apparently they can't find whatever courage it would take. And we see in academia, this groveling before can cancel culture. It wouldn't take much spine to stand up and say, we're gonna uphold free speech, uh, and if you don't like what someone said, you are free to say that they shouldn't have said it. But we're having trouble finding it. And then you take this uh, recent uh, scandal that seems to have engulfed the prime minister and other members of the cabinet over uh, we. Was there really nobody at the cabinet table who saw that this was a bad idea? Or if not morally wrong, at least likely to uh, look kind of bad? 
or was there just nobody with the guts to say it? Was there nobody willing to look the prime minister in the eye and say, you shouldn't do this? Because it's hard to believe the cabinet were collectively so witless that they didn't realize it was a problem. And I could go on and on about this. In fact, I'm going to. Um, this long-standing failure to address major problems in Canadian health care, particularly the waiting lists. Everybody knows they exist. Everybody knows they bring negative consequences, pain and suffering. People die on waiting lists in surprisingly large numbers, and they don't exist virtually anywhere else in the developed world. But if you speak up in favor of innovation, say, well, maybe our health system should be less restrictive. People say, oh, you want U.S. style health care. And this is completely ridiculous. I, I defy you to name anybody in Canada or anywhere, in fact, who suggested their country should adopt the American approach. There are no such person. So where, how much courage would it take to say, no, look, that's an idiotic objection. We should do it the way they do it in France or we should do it the way they do it in Sweden or here's something from Germany we could adopt. And yet, even among the people now running for the conservative federal leadership, is there one willing to say the Canada Health Act isn't sensible and we ought to change it? So instead, what you get, I did a little Google search, UCP healthcare, and this is what came up. There's a phantom debate about uh, cuts that aren't really happening. Why the UCP's healthcare privatization plans will fail, like the UCP wanted to privatize healthcare. I'm sure they did. Then stay informed, friends of Medicare. Then uh, a story mentioning that, in fact, the UCP is increasing spending on health care because it's the only thing anybody can ever think of because it's what everybody always did. Then tense negotiations ahead. And then Alberta NDP urging UCP to reverse health care cuts and so on. Um, and, and all of this is a debate that takes place because nobody's willing to stand up and say, look, our system is not the envy of the world. Just as nobody wants to adopt the American system, there's nobody out there saying, let's adopt the Canadian system, except perhaps Bernie Sanders, who clearly had no idea how it worked. Um, and it, it should be possible to say that, but people are afraid to say it. It's not that they don't know it. There are some politicians who don't know it, but most of them do. They're just afraid. And so this example, of course, brings me out to Alberta and to the UCP. And I know a lot of people put time, money, and hope into electing Jason Kenney because uh, they thought the NDP regime was no good and wasn't going to get better. And they thought if big blue replaced big orange, everything would be fine. And, you know, I know some of you may shuffle away from me there on the bench when I say this, but I find Jason Kenney to be a damp squib. I find him unwilling to stand up for most of the things that he once believed in. And frankly, I think he still does believe in. You know, go back, imagine the Jason Kenney who was president and CEO of Canadian taxpayers. What would he say about the big government approach of this Jason Kenney, who uh, is starting a new investment agency. Like, is this not a classic example of things government shouldn't do that Jason Kenney knows government shouldn't do? But if the old Jason Kenney were to confront the new Jason Kenney, he'd get a patronizing reply back. The old Jason Kenney was a self-proclaimed anti-abortion activist, but what does he want now? He wants the issue to go away. He's afraid to upset people. He just doesn't want it to be. And that's the same with reforming fiscal federalism, balancing the budget, protecting property rights, all these things that might cause controversy. They're just, you, you don't go near them because you're afraid to go near them. And again, I, this is something you've heard me say before if you've attended these conferences. And it's a place where I have a dog in the fight. I have a whole pack of dogs in the fight, especially today. Because one of the things we're going to need courage to admit is that politics as usual is not going to get it done. And it's so easy and comforting just to write a check to an establishment conservative party and go rah, rah, big blue and say, well, that took care of it. Because it's what we've always done. It's safe. No one will laugh at you for doing it. But one of the problems is that because people put too much faith in that and too little in moving the goalposts, Canada has far less robust to conservative infrastructure dedicated to exploring and advancing conservative principles and ideas and dragging the politicians along than we need. So that's why we, and we here is you, yes, I'm you, I point at you, yes, there we go. Um, and people you know and people they know need to give less to political parties and more to um, me. <laughs> well, there's so many worthy parts of the Canadian infrastructure. I just picked my favorite here and um, also the climate discussion nexus. Um, but there are others too. As you know, my, my brother's going to be addressing the conference. 
Well, the C.D. Howe Institute, they're good people, they're pushing the boundaries of good policy, and they need your support. You know, and, and I realize you're not rich, but if you are rich, give them a lot of money, and me too, and Danny, and you know, the Fraser Institute, the EA Dam, all these people. But if you're not, and you're still giving to political parties, take half of what you're giving to the political parties and give it in small monthly donations to us and Jordan Peterson and Mercadernet and all these people. Get out of your comfort zone. I saw a story that something like a quarter million people are members of the Federal Conservative Party eligible to vote in this crucial contest between Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole. And I know Derek Sloan is also running, and yes, he's come to our conference, and thank you, Derek, and you know, hope you'll do well. Leslie Lewis uh, is another not completely traditional candidate. But everybody agrees that the big showdown is between two guys who would fit in at Trudeau's cabinet table, and nobody would say, why are they here? And we all know it. So let's look at it squarely and say, this being true, what is a rational response to it? You know, and if you give us the money, we couldn't possibly make worse use of it than them, not even if we tried and we won't, which is, so here we go again. This is, um, you know, what makes a king out of a slave? What makes the flag on the mask to wave? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? What makes the dawn come up like thunder? At the end of all of this, the cowardly lion says, what have they got that I ain't got? And the answer, of course, is nothing. Because the punchline of The Wizard of Oz is that the Tin Man was kind all along. The Scarecrow was clever all along. If you watch the movie, the Scarecrow is supposed to got no brain, is forever coming up with the best ideas, and the lion is brave. And, you know, if we're going to defeat the perils we face, hearts, brains, and spines are going to be a winning combination. But we've got all this. And apart from passing the hat, the main concern here is one particular kind of courage. And I've, I think I've talked about this before, but it, I think it's so important that I dare to take up your time talking about it again. We need the courage to believe that things can be done differently than they were in the past. Because I think the biggest piece of timidity in Canadian public policy, the thing that stops us, is that even in situations where just about everybody wants a different result, nobody wants to try a different method. If you propose a genuinely radical reform in any policy area, the looks you get are not so much hostile or even puzzled, they're shocked. Like school vouchers. They're, they're, well, we've never done that, we can't do that. Healthcare, everybody knows the waiting lists are bad. Everybody says we're gonna shorten the waiting list. Doesn't matter what party, doesn't matter where in the country, doesn't matter what election, we're gonna shorten the waiting list. But then you say, well, what about contracting out to private surgeries? Oh no, we can't do that. You know, and it doesn't even matter that it's been done in Britain. It hasn't been done here, except in BC pretty much where the government has spent more than a decade and umpteen million dollars trying to crush Brian Day and Canby Clinic. And so, we just, we need to get past the argument that nothing can be changed. And here I want to mention that you may be, think, you may be thinking, well, hang on, in the face of COVID-19, we've shown amazing courage. Uh, we've shown rashness. We have locked down the healthy people in a society, which has never been done before. We didn't do this in the face of the pneumonic plague. We didn't do it in the face of the Spanish flu. And now, by the way, we're afraid to say Wuhan virus. Um, and we've done things, we've run deficits that would curl your hair, a federal $343 billion deficit. You think, well, nobody would have dared to say we should run a $343 billion deficit. Nobody was even willing to admit it until they were cornered. Um, and this might sound like rashness. And of course, when Jason Kenney decided that he too would spend umpteen gazillion dollars, um, he called it bold and ambitious. But it's not, right? That's what they've been saying for 50 or 60 years. And it's what they've been doing for 60 years, since the 1960s or even the 1930s. What they've done in the face of hard times is to borrow and spend. It's what the Alberta government would have done on autopilot. They'd have done it under the NDP. They'd have done it if there'd been no premier. Um, there isn't a hint of Calvin Coolidge or Andrew Mellon here. You know, even this, look at Kenny with his open collar dress shirt, right? Half casual. That's utterly standard PR. He doesn't even have the nerve to put on a different shirt. And so he runs a $20 billion deficit. But let me talk about the pre-COVID Kenny. Because as you know, we've had these conferences and we've talked about balancing the Alberta budget. We said, what are you gonna do? Because everybody says we wanna balance the budget. And we said, well, look, if you're gonna balance the budget and you've got a deficit, you either have to take in more money, spend less or some combination of the two. The old wait for growth plan has been tried since the 1970s 
and growth in government spending always outpaces growth in the economy, population and revenue, because nobody wants to tell somebody what Calvin Coolidge once did. These farmers came to him, oh, Mr. President, times are so tough, you know, the locusts have eaten the crops, there's a drought, weather's terrible, prices are low, it's also unfair. And when they run through all their complaints, Coolidge said, better get religion. And that was because Coolidge believed, and he said, he'd tell people, if you're in public office, nine out of 10 people who come to see you want something you shouldn't, they shouldn't have. And if you just sit there and say nothing at all, in three or four minutes, they'll run out of things to say and they will leave. And he literally would do this to people. When people came to Coolidge and asked for money, he wasn't afraid to offend them. He didn't pretend he was gonna give it to them. He didn't give it to them. He just sat there literally in silence until they left. But instead, you get somebody like Jason Kenney running on this sort of pseudo red meat platform that was actually processed plant protein because the February 2020 budget before the pandemic was going to run a $6.8 billion deficit. He wasn't going to balance the budget because doing that meant doing things that would annoy people and he didn't dare to annoy people. And you know, he would have got away with it too because there was not sufficient grit in his caucuses party or even his supporters to say, Hey, we didn't elect you to run deficits. And one reason why is they were afraid if they did that, the NDP would get in and run deficits. Here's the webpage for budget 2020. And even this, a plan for jobs in the economy. Oh, for goodness sakes, no, it's not. It's meant to be an accounting statement. Why must you always dole out this sludge? And it's the same sludge everybody doles out. It's timid. It's just, they don't dare say, here's the budget. It's about spending and taxing because people don't like either of those things. And then what does it start out? It says, Budget 2020 maintains budgets for health, education, and core social services. No cuts, okay? Nobody's getting their money taken away. Then it says we remain focused on creating jobs, growing our economy, and streamlining programs. Ah, streamlining. Because nobody suffers when you streamline to ensure a sustainable future. Our plan to get spending contro under control is working. Really? You're running a $7 billion deficit. Ah, we're on track to balance the budget by 2022-23. And we will continue to stand up for Alberta, blah, 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 right? There's nothing here you couldn't have predicted. There isn't a single thing here that represents an actual idea, let alone going to voters and saying, oh, here's a bad thing. Here's what we think we should do about it. Everything is fine. The social programs are fine. They're fundable. Nothing's wrong. The economy is fine. We're creating jobs. The economy is growing. We're efficient. We're sustainable. Spending is under control, but nobody's getting their money taken away and we're standing up. But then, you know, we're standing up for Alberta by seeking increased provincial power. Well, you've seen the Fair Deal report now. Was that worth it? You know, to me, that intended to look like listening while making sure the boat didn't rock even a quarter of an inch. Not the Alberta boat, not the Canadian boat, and very much not the Jason Kenney boat. But he wanted to hold a referendum on whether to negotiate with Ottawa over equalization in 2021. Talk about trying to divert the parade down a side street. Whether to negotiate, is this really an issue? Or is this just sort of running out the clock, hoping to get to the next election before he has to do anything? Now, as you know, I get in trouble for my dissatisfaction with uh, Tory uh, politicians. And I run into, I get heat from uh, Tory backers who think I'm in favor of Trudeau. And here's this, you vilified Harper in support of these criminals. And when I said, well, no, I, I objected to Harper running a deficit because I thought it meant that the liberals could say, see, deficits are good. Even Harper ran one. And it was called convoluted thinking. How is it convoluted to say if conservatives say something's okay, it's hard to criticize liberals for doing it. It seems to me very, very straightforward. But what happened to Harper in 2009 is the economy slumped and the other had to tell people government can't fix this. We're going to go through some hard times, but we'll come out better on the other side, or just toss his principles over the side and start handing out money to people and say, don't worry, we're stimulating the economy, and therefore nothing bad will happen to anybody, and spending doesn't matter, and borrowing doesn't matter. In fact, Keynes was right. Government borrowing creates wealth. That, this was taking the easy way out, and it was letting the programs run on autopilot. Basically, if you do nothing in hard times, these government programs give out more money. So you didn't challenge the practice and you didn't challenge the assumptions. And as I have pointed out, he lost the election anyway. So there wasn't uh, much to be said in favor of that. And he paved the way for Trudeau and his deficits. But although some of this may look like boldness, even recklessness, it's actually kind of timidity that has a weird tendency to resemble recklessness. 
you know Godwin's Law, all debates on the internet end with a Hitler comparison, and here one comes. But think back to the 1930s about the people who didn't confront Hitler because they thought it was too dangerous. They thought there were risks in confronting Hitler. And think of the risks that they ran by not confronting Hitler. They backed into a much more terrible peril, like some character in a cheesy horror comedy, like a Bob Hope film, where they hear a noise and back away and back straight into a lion's cage without ever looking. That's actually from a Donald Westlake novel, that image. And uh, remember the, the old Alberta PCs backed into an NDP interviewed by lacking the nerve to address their policy and political culture failings. They knew they were arrogant. They knew they were out of touch. They knew they were big spending, but they thought it would be too much trouble to admit it and deal with it. And instead, the NDP got elected. And I think that's also true of the failure to address Alberta's deficits before the pandemic came. It took too much courage to admit that we either need to get more money or spend less. And I talked about this in the uh, 2018 conference. I said, you know, here's where the money goes. Where do you want to cut? 21.4 billion health, 8.2 billion education, 6 billion advanced education, 3.3 community, 1.3 children's services. This is where the money goes. Are you willing to cut that? If not, don't go around growling about balancing the budget unless you're willing to raise taxes because the problem here is that the programs always outrun revenue. And I showed this slide about... You know, here's, here's the Alberta budget, revenue is the green line, but spending is the blue line. It's not a revenue problem, but even if you're not willing to face that, then get, go get more money. Um, but they never do. There's never any spending restraint, right? Ralph Klein, the famous slasher. If you were told Alberta had a premier who slashed spending and challenged to figure out when he was in office, and you looked at this line, you'd, you'd be perplexed, right? You'd never put the Klein where he really was. Um, Anyway, so maybe you'd say, fine, enough about that. Let's talk about Western alienation and stop insulting Jason Kenney. Okay, so the reason it's hard to fix Western alienation is that too many people don't want to admit there's a problem, especially in Eastern Canada, because if they admit there's a problem, then they have to do something about it, and they can see that this will require them to do something bold. And too many of the people who do admit there's a problem don't dare think big about the solutions. So let's take equalization. One of the problems with equalization is that it's constitutionally entrenched. And if you want whatever passes for masters of law in Canadian politics to blanch and fall silent, and by the way, there's a challenge there to identify that cultural reference by the end of the conference, you know, just dare to mention opening the constitution. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. We can't do that. Terrible things will happen. We're afraid even to look in the box. We know the constitution's a mess. We know there are all kinds of things wrong with it, but we can't do anything about it because nothing bold can ever be done. And this, there's a, this Quebec expression that I think I may have quoted last year, we know we're born to get the crumbs. And this is just not an attitude that I think we should be willing to tolerate in ourselves or in others. You know, we're going to spend the conference talking about what's wrong, talking in detail, what are the problems, what could we do about it, how could we do it. But in order to make this a productive discussion, we must not get into this trap of saying, oh yeah, everything stinks. And then either get into this, oh, I already left Canada. There's no Canada. And what about chemtrails? Or else go, yeah, it's too bad. I think I'll send a check for $20 to Peter McKay. We need to believe we can shoulder this burden. We need to believe we can brain this burden and that we can come up with plans that make sense and work. So on equalization, some years back, I don't know what I did, but it must have been terrible because at Sun News Network, I was made the in-house equalization expert which was a bit unfair because nobody understands it. I mean, nobody, the politicians don't understand it. The public service doesn't understand it. The expert panels don't understand it. I remember one expert panel was, was looking into equalization and discovered that there was a whole second equalization program they'd never heard of. So I was flung into this pit and um, I came up with an idea. Like, first of all, of course, the obvious thing, this program is, is twice cursed, right? It hurts the people who pay into it. It damages them economically, but it hurts the people who get it because it prevents their government from facing reality. It enables them to stagger forward with policies that spend too much money and fail to promote prosperity. And it makes them resentful. One of the reasons Albertans, uh, Quebecers don't like to talk about equalization is that in their hearts, they know it's a ripoff um, and they know they're the ones doing the ripping off. So I said, well, what can we do about equalization? And I, I came up with a proposal, dial it back until it is an emergency relief program 
for provinces that are facing insolvency. If you can't get rid of it, you can make it so small that most of the time nobody collects it and nobody pays into it and make it hurt. And I said, a province that's getting equalization should be deprived of its representation in parliament until it stops getting equalization. Now, I don't know if you think that's a good idea or a terrible idea, but it's an idea. It's a significant idea. It's a way to stop equalization from doing all the harm that it's doing. Or just make equalization way simpler, shorten the formula to a few lines that people can understand it. There are lots of things we can do, provided we're neither so timid that we fear ideas or so rash that we charge ahead without any. So um, in, in order to uh, stand up for Canada here and the wonderful Canadian spirit, I want to bring up a piece of Canadian culture because everybody loves being taught Canadian culture in school. But I think that this one might have passed you by. And if it did, you're in for a treat. You know, William Lyon Mackenzie King, when he finally left office horizontally, there was a poet named F.R. Scott, who was a fiery CCF progressive, very left wing. And one of his, Leonard Cohen set one of his works to music. So there's a nice piece of Canadian trivia for you. But when Mackenzie King died, Scott pin, penned this frustrated ode to this man and his suffocating political style, which was as dull as his personal life was weird. And that seemed to people on the left to make reform impossible, not by arguing against it on basis of principle, but by just draining all the energy and oxygen out of the room. So here's our, uh, here's our poem, William Lyon Mackenzie King. How shall we speak of Canada? Mackenzie King dead, the mother's boy in the lonely room with his dog, his medium and his ruins. He blunted us. We had no shape because he never took sides and no sides because he never allowed them to take shape. He skillfully avoided what was wrong without saying what was right and never let his on the one hand know what his on the other hand was doing. The height of his ambition was to pile a parliamentary committee on a royal commission to have conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription to let parliament decide later. Postpone, postpone, abstain. Only one thread was certain. After World War I, business as usual. After World War II, orderly decontrol. Always he led us back to where we were before. He seemed to be in the center because we had no center, no vision to pierce the smoke screen of his politics. Truly, he will be remembered wherever men honor ingenuity, ambiguity, inactivity, and political longevity. Let us raise up a temple to the cult of mediocrity. Do nothing by halves which can be done by quarters. And these phrases, it seems to me, ought to haunt Canadians. Not because we share Scott's view of what should have been done a century ago, but because we share his view that something should have been, that there should have been some willingness to take alternatives seriously and to have the nerve to follow ideas where they lead. So I want to end up where we started, which is, whoops, there we are, with Aristotle. In discussing the problems of Western alienation, of Alberta's place in Confederation, and of the policy problems and dilemmas that we face, we don't want to be rash. We don't want to be belligerent. We don't want to be foolish. We don't want to be paranoid. But we also don't want to be timid. We don't want to be doing nothing by halves that can be done by quarters. And we don't want other people to tell us, even if your grievances are legitimate, nothing can be done about them that will change anything. We don't want our policy, politics and our policy options to be shapeless, blunt, and futile. We want the courage to face the problem, to see what the alternatives are, and to find the right way forward so that we change things decisively for the better. And that's why what we need more than anything else, I believe, is what I'm sure people in this room have and what they need to inspire in others, and that's courage.